Somewhere in Sicily, a theatre is being prepared for performance. People are setting the stage, sorting out lights and sound, moving things around and banging them about. And now they've stopped, because our guest today has asked the team to pause setting up the show so that we can record this chat for Why Dance Matters, the Royal Academy of Dance podcast. That's a kind person. I'm David Jays, and our super considerate guest today is the dancer and choreographer Akash Odedra. Akash is based in the UK, but his work tours internationally. As we know, he's speaking to us from Sicily. He's an immensely skilled Kathak dancer and has collaborated with artists from and beyond the UK, from and beyond his dance form. Each piece he makes seems more questioning, more ambitious than the last. And the next one, Songs of the Bulbul, is a highlight of the programme at the Edinburgh International Festival this summer. Akash's manner is gentle, quiet, reflective, but his life didn't begin that way. A childhood spent in one of the rougher bits of the UK and a complicated family setup. Under the bonnet of his mesmerising work sit difficult subjects like dyslexia or ageing. It's always exciting to find out what makes an artist tick and everyone's waiting for us to get going in Sicily. So let's go. Akash, welcome to Why Dance Matters. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And I understand you are in Sicily, you're on tour. Is this quite a familiar scenario for you? I get the sense that you're touring quite a lot. Yeah, touring, but also creation in various countries. So we shift our entire team to different parts of the world for creation. So it's quite a normal part of life. And I feel like each creation has a new discovery. And does your work land differently in different places, even if you're bringing a piece that you've created in one place somewhere else, does that that change how it feels? If it's incredible and beautiful outside, it's very hard to stay in the theatre and stay focused (laughs) Um, (laughs) and kind of navigate outside. Um, It just makes it harder. It just means that you have to be more determined. So, I mean, no, each place, each country, each theatre staff and especially the collaborators that are there present kind of start to shift the course of the creation. So sometimes it might have been destined to be something had it have landed in a certain country and maybe it starts to shift and take into account the environment and the energy of the place. And a lot of your work starts with a collaboration, starts with a meeting of minds with someone from the same art form, from dance, but perhaps based in a different place or a different kind of dance or poetry or music. When do you know that that's going to be a really creative conversation that you'll have? You never know, actually, if I'm um, to be honest. There's something about the individual or the poetry or the scenography or the picture, the image, the sound that connects to a cell or the soul within you, somewhere, a fragment. And it's that intuition and that little string which is connected to a little part of you somewhere that kind of tugs on you and pulls you and you don't know it's really a journey of curiosity that may lead you down a path that feels incredible and exciting and may turn out to be an incredible collaboration and sometimes it doesn't and that's why for me it's really important to have this very long drawn out research and development period and even the creation period a lot of the pieces actually get developed over a couple of years a good couple of years because sometimes it's about getting you may like something about the individual or the idea but it just doesn't have the right substance at that point to go from the internal to the external and it's all about that right because everything is this kind of process of cooking in the imagination 
And it's about when is this dish ready to be served as a five course, five star meal. You know, <laughs> it, it takes time to actually really allow things to simmer and develop. And sometimes it just doesn't always turn out the way you want it to be, but it may turn out even better or, or not so good. Yeah. And when do you know when that meal is ready to be served? Do you have a really clear sense of, yep, yeah, we now need to get out of the kitchen? When you get onto the stage and the last light goes off, you kind of get a sense from the audience before the light comes on, <laughs> whether they want seconds or, you know, they're just happy with the first round and ready to move on to dessert or whatever. Do you kind of know from that point, there are a few productions where you, you think, it's fine here in this country, but what about when it goes to, you know, London or Sadler's Wells? Because the audience from country to country shifts slightly. And you have those productions which can kind of swipe and glide through all the countries and people get it. And you have certain ones which are very specific to experiences of people from that nation that sometimes you're trying to share. So for me, it's about the language of the soul. If the fragrance kind of touches something which is deep within you or mankind or humanity, then I feel like you know it's going to go. And you can instantly tell by the energy of people. And I, I rely less on what they tell me afterwards and more in that moment of it worked, it felt good. And it, it's a two-way thing because when the audience see the piece and the last light goes off, we've been giving and taking energy the whole way through the performance it's subconsciously it's not just us giving it's also this kind of play that happens and it's this non-visible energy that's going back and forth and i think that's incredible and that's when you kind of know there's a connect that has been, there's been there's been a subconscious dialogue let's put it that way i'm loving the culinary metaphor as well actually i feel this is there's something really generous about that that you're not just creating a work for yourself you are serving it up to other people it's not just about something that's satisfying to you it's something that's going to be meaningful and fulfilling for your audience as well yeah i think so and that's really important because if it was only for me i could do that in a studio why do i need to go public and make a very big deal out of it and involve you know that's a different experience i think and here it's about you translating and becoming a transmitter for the energy from the audience to yourself and to the divine or the space around you and from the space to the audience. So I think that's really important that you are this vessel. And if you're a vessel, you've got to take into account other people's experiences, tastes and relatable experiences. I think that's the most important thing to make it relatable and accessible. come back to some of those flavors <laughs> in a bit but just to go to the back to the very beginning how did dance enter your life i get the sense that you were a small dancing child from pretty early on yeah i learned to walk and i learned to walk right on on point so i used to work on my two toes and they always used to say oh, he's going to be a dancer and i was very very young when i learned to walk so i was 8 months old when i started walking and for me, everything was dance, opening a door, picking up a glass. You know, I, I always have this story about when I stopped my mother from opening a door, I used to teach her how she should use her wrist to open the door. And of course, she would tell me to you know, shut up. <laughs> and, since, and, you know, I used to do these things where I used to drop pennies on the table. And I was the only child for 10 years. So I used to play with these coins. But the coins for me were bodies of dancers. And I was only three. And now I look back at it, I was choreographing, I was saying, this group comes here, this cross is here. So for me, I was dancing and choreographing, I suppose, before I was conscious of what the terminology meant. It was about then officializing in it and sharing that kind of inner world with people. And I loved living in that world of fantasy. It was far better than the world that surrounded me. So I, I think as I grew, I wanted to bring people into that world and make them experience my world, but also the world within them. You know, this kind of untapped potential energy of imagination that over the years of education kind of gets suppressed and kind of shrinks. And I, I like to make people feel like they felt when they watched their first Disney movie or I mean, whatever it was. I think that's for me really important 
to give this sense of hope and also to take people into this journey. So for me, from childhood, it was a big part of my life. My dance was my language. And I think you had quite a complicated family situation when you were growing up. It wasn't necessarily the calmest environment. Was dance a bit of a, a, a refuge, a place that you could retreat into when everything else was a bit chaotic? Yeah, it was always the world that I could go back to or into or immediately close my eyes and you know put some music on and run away. And sometimes it wasn't about running away. It's about the two environments that didn't match the world within myself and the world externally. It felt like it was the calm in the storm, the eye of the storm, this point of stillness. But at the same time, dance could also be the storm and it could channel the storm. It was a good place to be able to actually create your own storm, your creative, constructive storm that you can then release into a breeze that will give a different type of freshness, a different type of oxygen and air to the environment around you to create this oasis, this escape that I could allow my child, my dance to flourish and nourish. And when did that kind of instinctive dancing, choreographic impulse become more formal? When did you start taking dance lessons? Eight. I was very specific that it had to be Indian classical dance because in that world I felt the gods and goddesses dance. So it kind of mixed with the world of imagination and possibilities in my mind. There was something very distinctively Indian about me, even though I was born in England, brought up in England. I suppose it was my grandmother's influence because I was kind of raised by my grandmother. I just connected to this form because it made me feel very spiritual and very connected to myself and the cells in my body which spoke about my ancestry. So it was at the age of eight, uh, then finally my father came with a phone number and said, here's a number, and I never looked back. I was there early in the class, I was watching the senior class through the small window. And you know, I, I was so focused as a child because it felt I just entered heaven. And I, and I finally, I found a channel where people are actually inhabiting the world that exists only in my imagination, which is this world of movement, of epicness. So it was only at the age of eight that I started to officially train. And as well as that world of, of epic imagination and the fantasy that it opens up, it is also, of course, an incredibly rigorous dance form. Was that when little dancing, Akash, kind of <laughs> hit that class, was that also something that appealed or was that something you had to get your head round? No, I was very hyperactive. I mean, everyone used to get fed up with me. I think I was very, very, very hyper. I think they used to say I'm quite a hyper child. I think I was as well. And the class wasn't enough for me. I wanted more and more and more and more. That's why I used to go early to watch the seniors and then take that kind of material and start to take what I was formerly seeing and try and construct it so that it would mix with the world. And I had a lot of energy as a child, but it's different when you start doing things for fun versus when it starts to become a career and then the process of refinement starts. When refinement starts, you realize that actually there's no end to it. You know, sometimes it's a process of torture and you think, why do you do it? But I suppose there's something within you that pushes you to try and refine yourself because I suppose art is a reflection of life and you're trying to refine yourself for, for a better purpose, maybe a spiritual purpose. So for me, yeah, I wanted more dance, more vigor, more passion. The more I got, the less I had and I wanted more. I was like this as a kid. And it sounds as if for you there was never any question that you would make a career in dance. Was that a conversation you had to have with, with your family? I don't think they really cared. So I come from a Rajput community, which is a royal warrior caste, and the men are real men. And um, it's a very, it's, you know, and especially then, there was no boys dancing. So it was something which was considered very feminine. And what are you doing dancing? The men do dance, but there's this particular warrior kind of thing that they do. But the world that I was going into belonged to a different class, let's say, of Indians not to the ones which I belong to. So in the greater community, yeah, it was a laughing stock. To the family, they didn't care because that's all they seen me do. There was a lot of teasing from certain cousins and it did make you feel 
less than the world around you. But that's where my imagination was like my genie's lamp where I could go into. And I knew that one day these same people will be seeing my life through my lens. And that's what kind of happened. But not to say the road was easy at all. There was many obstacles at every turn. But I think such is the madness of an artist that they lose themselves in this world so far that they no longer know the difference between the world of reality and fantasy. I read a lovely description from the great dancer who you've worked with, Aditi Mangaldas, who said that as a performer, you had the lightness of the spirit of a gazelle and the inner strength and peace of the Buddha, which is quite a gorgeous thing to say. Is that a description that resonates with you? I mean, that's what she says, and that's very great. Of, <laughs> that kind of shows her humility. And I mean, she's a legend. She's a living legend in herself and for her to say that, that's big. I mean, I can't accept the words because I feel like it's hard to be objective when you are the object and that's kind of her objective. But if I was to pick that apart, I feel that spirituality is a big part of my life. You know, it's a big conquest in my life. It's very much entwined in my dance and for that, one has to feel light at least in my experience and and I suppose that comes through that manifests itself into the physical and I suppose she's seeing what I practice off stage and also of course on stage as well I mean I don't know I mean people have different versions of what they think <laughs> what they see and feel you know <laughs> yeah but would you say that your dance is a spiritual practice it feels very closely connected when you talk about it yeah, I mean, it, it is. I mean, even the dance itself, because otherwise it would be exercise. What's the difference between going to a gym, putting earphones on and running on a treadmill versus what we do? There has to be something that moves the soul. It's not just the body that moves. What is the soul? The soul is accumulation of your experiences. It's something that you cannot put into words or understand. This idea of this soul is something that people have argued over for so long. But the soul for me is what it means to you. What's your greater potential? That for me is the spiritual arm of life, that it's those experiences that kind of feed in. It's your way of physicalizing the untangible. It's your way of bringing this greater consciousness into the living body, into this being. And not only that, the practice and the art of sharing it with people who in turn may be able to take something from that. This kind of like spiritual arm for me glides across every avenue of life because it is a, a way and a perspective of being able to look at life differently and to be able to also shed light on serious subjects and also uh, lighter situations. But it's more about freeing the caged bird within you and within all around you. Is that, do you think a distinctively British flavour to Katak from Britain? Has it, as that, as the form has developed here, has it taken on its own, to go back to food, its own flavour that is very distinctive? Yeah, dance for me is not something, especially Katak, if, you know, people talk about tradition, and traditional dance, and it should stay the way it is and as it was creative. But change is the only constant in life. Everything has to breathe and move. So why should an art form be stagnant? Influence has been a huge thing in any architecture of any country, with any invasion, with any crossover, with any type of cross-pollination. So naturally, as an artist, you absorb the environment around you. And if your dance is a result of your experiences, it is going to have a British Asian flavor because there's certain aesthetic sensibilities that you grow up with that then you start to incorporate into your work, into your art. And I feel like, yes, definitely, there is a kind of finesqueness 
that British Kathak dancers have in India, it's very different. You know, there's a sense of it being a bit more raw. I'm generalizing right now, but there is a flavor, even in the taste of music and musicality, you know, because a lot of the dancers in India are very happily spoiled because they have such a variety of music and musicians around them. And whereas with us, you know, we're from going to a club and listening to an R&B or sitting in a car listening to classic FM, I think there is something, if it moves you, it's going to come into your dance somewhere. And in your sensibility, because ultimately you are going to take pieces of music that you have kind of related to through your life or experiences or aesthetics that you have related to. So Kathak has definitely taken a shape and a different shape in the West, especially in England. It definitely has its own flavor and its own aroma. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that should be celebrated. We mentioned your collaboration with Aditi Mangaldas just before. Um, alongside that, because that was a piece about people of different ages, you and your company were working with older people in care homes and community groups. What did you learn from that experience? What did you take away? I love elderly people. I was brought up by my grandmother. I mean, we have such an emphasis now, generally in the arts. And, you know, you look at all these applications. It's very young, young, young talent, talent, young talent. I mean, there's not much out there. And what was incredible about this is this project was truly unique because when we put this call out, we thought, okay, we'll have 20, 30, 40 people. I think it ended up being something like 450 people. And they were all super committed. And it was incredible because in Mehek Live, you know, we offered a small kind of morsel of food and they went home, cooked a meal and gave it back to us. They were so committed. They were so passionate. They were there at every rehearsal, you know, and from the age of 55 to I think it was 90 something or 80. I can't remember what it was. All of these people gave back because it was almost like a lot of these people had locked the, these unfulfilled fantasies and dreams away. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of them thought they'll never be able to live it anywhere except for the living room. But here we kind of got this key and locked it and it was like Pandora's box. This incredible world unlocked for everyone. And it was super inspiring for me. In fact, before going on the stage of Sadler's Wells, for me, they did, the group did a sharing in Sadler's in the studio theatre. I quickly ran from my changing room to go and have a look at them. And for me, more than the performance itself, that was my special moment. Because just seeing the potential of two people who were coming on stage effectively to do a dance work to an audience that was going to pay and watch this show, etc., etc. This became a story for everyone to cherish and remember. There was 55 people, I think, performing that day in Sadler's Wells, you know, all dressed up, came on buses from Leicester. And it just showed me the importance of spirit and dreaming and never giving up, no matter what age you are. It just shows that nothing is impossible at any stage in your life. And it was super inspiring for me that this happened. This was my dream. I always wanted to work with elderly people. Now the question is, how do I keep that going? It's not about that being a one-off project. And I'm passionate to reinvent this group in different ways so that they can continue and that we can continue our, our relationship with the community. Because for me and the company, we are based in Leicester and the area we're based in is one of the most deprived wards in the whole of England, I believe. But it isn't deprived in terms of its richness in culture, in terms of the people that are there, in terms of what they offer. None of the councillors are offering us anything and I can say that very loudly, nothing's changed, but we bring the change. And I think that is what is so beautiful. It just connected me even deeper and embedded me even deeper into their lives and the life of where the company is based. And to stay true to those roots and to keep connecting with many other mature roots that have so much wisdom and knowledge. And that's all the elders in my community and the communities around. 
And does your relationship with dance change as you get older as well? And you described tiny Akash already choreographing pennies and door handles. But as you get older, do you feel dance differently? Do you think about it differently? I've been looking for a sense of peace for 39 years of my life. And I feel like in the last two months, I feel like I found some level of peace. Peace isn't sitting and meditating underneath a bunion tree or giving up all your worldly materialistic life to, you know, go and live as a yogi. But peace is a sense of contentment and the sense of if I have half a bread slice, be happy with it. If I have nothing to eat, be happy with it and find the best in any situation. Don't expect or demand in that way. Find something through what you've been given and make the most of it. And I suppose this has changed my outlook to dance where I think I'm a lot more relaxed and at peace with myself and I feel I'm a lot more eased. I don't feel the panic of stage as I used to feel the anxiety of going on and delivering and the pressure of delivering because ultimately there's a lot of people investing in you financially and you know so I think dance for me has shifted and it's gone through many incarnations but this last one is the most beautiful the latest one which is the sense of peace I think which has changed my dance and it's I just feel whatever I do there's a sense of contentment which I was always longing for and looking for in life. And the next incarnation on stage, the next bit of the journey, takes you to Edinburgh, to the International Festival, because there's a new piece there. Tell us about that. What can we expect? So that's called Songs of the Bulbul. So it's about a mythical Persian bird and a story about how this bird's voice is so divine and beautiful that it can't be bought. It, it, the sum of this bird can't be compared to anything. So anyway, this, when this bird is captured and given to whoever it's given to, um, there's a process of refining this bird. And it, because this bird was a free bird, it was a loose bird. And when this bird is caged, its sort of song starts to become more desperate because it sings of something we all yearn for, which is freedom. And in this process of refinement, so from this golden cage near a window, it's taken away from the window, then the cage is bound. So the bird suffers in darkness. And through that and through its desperation, it calls. And there's its, its call and its song becomes more desperate and more powerful and more potent. And in the last version of it, the bird loses its eyes. Its eyes are removed for its final purpose of training and refining. And in that final moment, the bird sings its last song, the most powerful, the most heart-wrenching, soulful song before it leaves its body, it leaves its cage, because there's no other option for it now other than to leave. And for me and for Rani as well, the choreographer, this felt like a journey of an artist because every time we perform, we leave a part of our souls. We die a little on stage until there will be nothing left to give. And there's this process of refining, refining, refining till you have no more to refine when there's nothing left. When you leave this body, which was your tool and also your cage, you know, it's quite a story which is close to our hearts and... um you know, how do you take a subject which becomes very heavy in the end, even poetically, and kind of create this sense of lightness or this sense of freedom? And I think what we're trying to say is even when it's the end, it's not really the end. Let's use our imagination, whether you believe in God or an afterlife or, or not, is not the point. Use the imagination to say this individual is free. And I think there's a beauty in that idea of just being free or feeling someone is free. Gosh, the meal is almost at an end. My plate is empty. I'm about to start licking my fingers. Before I do that, one last question, which is this one. Why does dance matter to you? 
dance for me is the language of humanity. It's a language of the soul. It's a language before languages were invented. It's the small gestures, the unspoken words, the unsung poetry of life and of every conversation. It's language of the soul and for me it matters because it doesn't belong to any particular country or geography. It belongs to everyone. When you walk, you dance. When you breathe, you dance. When your heart pulses, you dance. You dance to the rhythm of life. And life, for me, is dance. And that's why it matters. If a conversation can be like a meal, I feel very satisfied after talking to Akash. The world premiere of Songs of the Bulbul is at the Lyceum Theatre in Edinburgh from the 9th to the 11th of August. There are links to the show and to the RAD's work in our show notes. And please do subscribe and like the podcast so that you never miss an episode. Our guest today was Akash Odedra. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Keisha Dodd and Katie Hagen, and our artwork is by Bex Glendening. Our producer, always a happy meal, is Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon. <laughs>